Hello, today is March 14th, the year 2003. My name is Dr. Tom Bennett. I'm from Kane University and I'm with the Battleship New Jersey Oral History Program. Today I'm aboard the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey, and I'm talking with Mr. Sam Kunchevich, uh, who served aboard the battleship from 1943 to 1944. He was a plank owner as one of the original crewmen. He served as a damage control person. He was also involved in helping build the ship. Uh, Sam, thank you for talking with us today. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, how did you come to be involved with the Battleship New Jersey? Well, when I got aboard the, uh, the ship, which was quite an unusual situation, at least to most people who hear about my story, I originally enlisted in the Air Force in the uh, latter part of 1942. Uh, they questioned me as to uh, what my background was, and uh, they were looking for aerial photographers, which the Air Force was very short of. And they had a program which they considered was secret. They needed aerial photographers, and they were taking anybody who had any kind of photographic background. Uh, since this was supposed to be a confidential thing, I was sent to Washington, uh, the Motion Picture Service, and I was trained in the use of special cameras. Uh, uh, the average camera in those days was the Graflex 4x5, which was a common newspaper camera. It was special fitted with a special lens for aerial photography. They even issued a license that authorized uh, my ability uh, to use that camera. But I was also trained in using the 35 millimeter projection, 16 millimeter projection, eight millimeter projection. And uh, I hardly ever got to use any of that equipment. But they decided I was to be sent to the South Pacific to photograph the results of B-25, B-17 uh, bombing runs. And what kind of results did they get? This was supposed to be confidential or even classified secret. But the Air Force refused to take me there for one particular reason. They said, we cannot risk a million dollar aircraft, a pilot, and a common ordinary uh, serviceman in that particular sign of phase because we were losing a heck of a lot of aircraft to the Japanese in those early days. Somebody came up with the bright idea. <clears throat> Somebody came up with the idea that the battleship New Jersey was going in the right direction. Let's put them in the Navy. And I guess it took a little bit of convincing to get the ship to accept my presence on board a ship. After all, I was an Air Force man and not a Navy man. So when I reported to the ship in San Diego, they asked me, what was your background at the Navy Yard? I said, I was a shipfitter. They said, that's good enough. You're a shipfitter first class because we don't have any shipfitters on board. And I was assigned to the ship. They were a little bit unhappy because I had no Navy uniform and I was walking around with an Air Force uniform. And I guess I was a little bit conspicuous. So they said, we'll give you a uniform to get you out of the ordinary. As uh, time went on, with various locations where we had some gunfire, when we got in the area of New Zealand, they said, uh, we cannot afford to keep you on board anymore because we can't pay you. We have no records of your background or anything of that sort. 
I said, we're going to dump you off at, at uh, New Zealand. And that's where I left, left the ship. Of course, it took me about a year to get there. And I was surprised at the number of misfits, if you want to use that term. There were sailors, Marines, Army men, all people who were for one reason or another, were lost from their original outfit. And uh, they decided to send them all to uh, southern China, to General Chenault's Flying Tigers area, where they had a few bombers. And I felt that was, there was an ideal location for the job I was sent to. So uh, in the process of being there for about Six months I ran out of cameras because I had to give away what few cameras I had with me. They said, if you wanted to get replacement parts or additional cameras, you had to go to Karachi, India. Uh, I forgot the actual location. It was a British uh, supply depot. And believe it or not, they had all kinds of American equipment, and to add insult to injury, here the British were getting equipment from the United States at no cost, but if we wanted anything, we had to pay for it. But of course, we had no money, we had to sign for it. I doubt very much though that... <coughs> I doubt very much whether many of them uh, applied for re recompensation for any of the equipment that was given to us. And that was taken back to uh, uh, Chenault's outfit, and uh, additional people were trained in aerial photography. Uh, one of the most unusual situations I got into, uh, we had a small training area for bombers. Uh, and in that outfit, uh, we had an ammunition dump at the end of the one of the runways. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, one day, one of the officers asked me if I had anything to do. And I said, no, not particularly. He says, you want to take a ride? We got a little fire out near one of these small ammunition buildings. And uh, we drove out there in a jeep, and just as we got to the ammunition shack, uh, he hollered, get out. Uh, not knowing what was happening, I did. I jumped out, and he jumped out, and he started to crawl underneath the jeep, and I wondered what the heck's going on, and here, off to the left, came two Japanese fighter bombers, and they started machine gunning the area. Uh, this originally is what started the brush fire that started uh, at the end of the field. And uh, apparently they knew that this was an ammunition shack and they were trying to blow it up. However, their shooting wasn't that good and they missed it. But that was uh, the end of that. Did you ever uh, meet General Chenault or see him at all? Uh, how was that again? Did you ever see or meet General Chenault? Yes, I did. Uh, I met him, I met his wife, and I also met his uh, son, who, uh, oddly enough, uh, had been trained at the original station in the Air Force where I uh, <coughs> had my basic training. And... Uh, it seems, uh, which is another story, uh, during my basic training, uh, I was given the M1 uh, carbine rifle to fire. Uh, we had a target range of about 50 yards, and uh, we were given two shots at the target. Uh, during my first shot, up went the red flag. They said I missed. So I was given a second shot. 
Up went the red flag. They said, I missed again. Then all of a sudden, a black flag went up. I had two bullseyes. They didn't know that the, that was what happened. The drill sergeant, <coughs> you have to excuse me, the uh, presentations I made just tackling, telling on me. Well, anyway, he said, uh, where did you learn to shoot like that? I said, uh, very simple. I just uh, came natural, I guess. He says, well, I'm going to give you five shots, and I want you to try it out again. The first four shots, black flag, four bullseyes. When the fifth shot, I got a nine. He said, uh, <coughs> are you interested in becoming a sniper? I said, no, I joined the Air Force to fly. He says, well, that takes care of that. <coughs> anyway, they found out I had photographic experience, and they said, we got a job for you. And that was the beginning of my uh, shipboard experience. How did that lead to your shipboard experience? <laughs> How was that again? How did that lead to your shipboard experience? There was very little work to be done on a ship, actually, uh, outside of minor repair to doors. Uh, gaskets were always wearing out. Uh, there was a number of uh, uh, fire retardant uh, doors that uh, the uh, the gaskets were not really that good, and they had to be replaced. So that was kind of minor work. But when I got back to the uh, Air Force uh, base, which was the latter part of 1944, they, uh, they questioned me, we thought you were supposed to be in North Africa. And here, somebody had the records messed up. I was assigned to the 315th Bomb Squadron, which was in North Africa, who later made the initial invasion of southern Italy. And uh, they didn't know where the heck I was. So they finally accepted the fact that I was free from the initial, initial assignment that I was on, but I had very little to take back. <coughs> Anyway, by that time, uh, then, no, it was uh, Dover Air Force Base decided they needed a 35 millimeter projection operator, and I was assigned to Dover. And uh, shortly afterwards, I uh, went to Fort Dix for my discharge. And I believe I'm one of only a few people that have a discharge from the Army Air Force, from the Navy, and from the Air Force Reserve. How were you discharged from the Navy? Yeah, they, uh, they gave me credit for one year's service on, on, on the battleship New Jersey. So then, and they were... entitled me to a Navy discharge. So you have three discharges. I have three discharges. The Army, the Navy. Army, the Navy, and the Army Air Force. Army Air Force, interesting. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your experiences aboard the battleship New Jersey. What did you do? You were a pipe fitter, but was there much work for you to do or no? Well, during the early days on board the ship for almost a month, I was trampling around the ship uh, <clears throat> doing minor uh, maintenance work, principally uh, replacing gaskets and doors and hatches and scuttles. Uh, they had very few people that knew how to do that. Uh, they made a common mistake of uh, putting grease on them, which was very dangerous as far as the gasket was concerned because they, it just destroyed the, the rubber gasket it destroyed any of the gaskets in any type of door. 
there were several types of doors. Uh, the common non-tight door, which had no gasket whatsoever. Standard watertight door. The uh, metal joiner door, which there was two types of that. Uh, one which was uh, no tight, one which was fume tight. Uh, fume tight doors were used in uh, battery charging spaces uh, where fumes are generated and they had to keep the fumes exhausted at all times. So they had to have a fume type door. But uh, door gaskets were in very poor condition after a period of time purely through uh, closing and opening, mishandling of the treatment of the, that type of uh, gasket. Uh, I even see that on the, on the ship today. The gaskets are painted, which is entirely not to be done. Now, before you joined the battleship and before you went in the military, you worked at the Philadelphia Naval Yard? Yeah, I worked in the uh, on the battleship Wisconsin the battleship New Jersey. Uh, there's several experiences I had which were kind of unusual, a little bit comical. As I mentioned uh, some time ago, uh, we had a lot of Welsh, Scottish, and Irish shipbuilders who came here who knew the job. And I was fortunate to work under a group like that. One day, I was approached by the supervisor. He said, we're going to leave our mark on this ship, the battleship New Jersey. We were getting very close to the closing off of the skirt end of the ship, as far as hull plating was concerned. But you had to understand that shell plating always came before installation with approximately seven inches of surplus material. This is purely to compensate for any misalignment in any of the plating at either end. But that was not cut off. They kept adding that on. The result was the ship ended being seven inches longer than any of the other three ships of the class. Uh, we had to almost swear that we were not going to say anything about what we were going to do because they were afraid that Wisconsin was going to follow suit. <coughs> so then you were, you were involved in making sure that the battleship New Jersey was the longest of the Iowa-class ships. Yeah. Did anybody know about that besides your little group? Fortunately, they were able to keep it secret within our own group. We had about seven men in, in each group. Uh, my particular job as a helper, I was moved from one time to another from the New Jersey to the Wisconsin, wherever they were lagging behind in any particular type of work I was to assist to try to bring them up to date. And then I'd be back at the New Jersey again. When people found out that the New Jersey was seven inches longer, what was the reaction? <coughs> Uh, it was during the gay Korean period when the, <coughs> when, the, when the ship was being <coughs> when the ship was being prepared for the dry dock. All those wooden blocks had to be fitted exactly to the hull of the ship. When the ship was slowly lowered down in decreasing water load, it was to sit exactly in right position. In order to do that, they had to know the exact length of the ship. <coughs> when the ship was measured from bow to stern, they ended up scratching their heads saying, why the heck is this ship seven inches longer than it's supposed to be? They said, well, maybe we made a mistake. Let's try it again. Seven inches longer. And that was the end of the st story because it really didn't matter that seven inches, but it did matter as far as the record was concerned. So nobody really knew why 
the ship was that much longer. I doubt today whether there's anybody left of that original group outside of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting point. What else can you tell us about the construction of the battleship in New Jersey? Anything else that's interesting? The work schedule? Well, when uh, the hull plating, the shell plating, and the main deck was almost complete, the superintendent of ships who was in charge of installing the gun turrets, he had to calculate the weight of the first turret to be installed. That was turret number one. He had to calculate the weight without the armor plating, without the gun barrels. This was installed after the turret was installed on the ship. He calculated the weight of that turret at 750,000 pounds. The only crane that was available for lifting that weight <coughs> was rated at 780,000 pounds. It meant there was a margin of error of 30,000 pounds. And that's only equal to one of the anchors on this ship. Somebody says, asked him, what the heck are you going to do now? You've got a margin of error. And the next crane available won't be available for the next three days. He said, I'm going to stand underneath that turret. <clears throat> From the time it's lifted up to the time it's installed on the ship. He was asked this time, why the heck are you going to risk your life under that turret because of that margin of error? He said, very simple. If that crane should fail and that turret came down, I will not be available to answer any questions as to what the heck happened and why. We found out later on he knew something about that crane that we didn't know. It had a margin of error or a safety factor of a hundred thousand pounds. So he really wasn't taking any risk whatsoever, but he had to be dramatic and he satisfied a question. Interesting. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your experiences aboard the ship again. <clears throat> when it was in the Pacific, were you involved in any combat situations? And uh, there was a few air areas where we did a lot of shore bombardment prior to uh, a landing period, which uh, we didn't get into, but other than uh, sort of suffering up process of shell bombardment. One of the guys once asked, what kind of a hole in the ground does one of these shells make? Well, according to actual measurement, uh, it was 55 feet wide and 50, 15 feet deep. <coughs> and I was told that concussion could kill a man within 50 yards. So outside of a few shower bombardment, uh, there was not a great deal of action until after I left the ship. And when did you leave the ship again? It was in the latter part of 1944 when they dropped me off at uh, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that you want to tell us about your experiences in the Navy Yard or aboard the ship that you think is important for other people to know? Uh, as far as the Navy Yard was concerned, I can truly say this, that yard, Philadelphia Navy Yard, was probably the most friendly area I ever worked in, in spite of all the shipyards I went to. They didn't even have to know your name. They called you shipmate. Uh, the early process of reporting to work was very informal. They had a keyboard with a number of tags with your number on it, 
your employment number. You gave them that number and they turned the tag over, which meant you were there. When you left, they turned the tag back over again. We had some unfortunate incidents. One in particular I can remember. The, uh, they were loading some of the plates that was being installed on the deck plating. And uh, one of the cranes, uh, by a shop labor man, 72 shop to be exact, they hooked up these clamps on two ends of the plate and they lifted it up. He made the mistake of walking too close to the underneath that plate and one of the holders let go. Unfortunately, he didn't survive. It fell right on top of him. But we had an interesting thing working in the shops. I was assigned at that particular time to what was normally called the shearers. And that was where they trimmed off excess material from either uh, a long angle plate or shell plating or any type of plating. <clears throat> The man in charge of the, that machine would sight the object being trimmed off underneath that particular shears. And the people in back of them would guide that particular plate to either to the left or to the right. And when there was a shortage of material coming through, one piece of material would be held purely as a uh, factor to show that you had something to do. Every once in a while, a ship superintendent would come through the shop, might be a lieutenant, might be a commander, sometimes a captain. And they had a very unique way of warning people that an officer was coming through. If it was a lieutenant, the man at the end of the shop would put a single finger across his left arm. If it was a commander, he'd put two fingers, two stripes. If it was a captain, three stripes. And that would be passed down the line from one person to another. Nobody said a word. All they did was watch for that finger on a man's sleeve. And that would tell them who's coming through. <clears throat> and that would cause, that would preclude any problems from yeah. turning up, right. Um, talk to us a little bit about after the, the war was over. Um, how did your experiences aboard the battleship New Jersey uh, impact your later life? Well, <clears throat> that, that uh, reminds me of something else a little bit completely different. There's a lot of risk involved in working in the shops not so much of the overhead crane carrying material that you had to stay away from. But one time on the shears, we were trimming a 10 foot <coughs> piece of angle. They were taking a one inch strip off of one leg of that angle. As the angle protests through the machine, the end that was cut it was starting to curl in a loop type shape. They took a chain and they wrapped it around to pull it tight to keep the thing from flying around. Before they got through with that particular piece of angle, the chain let go. And two minutes before that, one man was standing off to one side. And when that chain let go, he had accidentally moved away and the chain came around and cut off a man's jacket who was hanging on a piece of structure, completely cut it clean like it was cut with a scissors. So it shows the kind of dangers that could be involved. So they must have had a lot of safety procedures. In place. Yeah. In my estimation, and the, the guy who was uh, the sheer captain, uh, he was kind of shook up because he knew that 
that would have killed a man. <clears throat> well, let's move on then. Once you uh, leave the, the military and the Navy, um, again, what impact did the battleship have in your later life? How did you stay involved with the ship? Uh, well, I, I really can't say uh, one way or another. Uh, there were so many incidents that took place in the shop, incidents that took place on the ships, incidents that took place in New Zealand, incidents that took place at uh, uh, Chenault's outfit, like the, the two Japanese bombers that came over and started firing at us. It's, it's hard to pinpoint any one in particular that stood out more than any other outside of the, those that I already mentioned. Uh, one thing we talked about before, uh, you said you had met General Chenault. Uh, can you describe him to us at all? I don't quite follow uh, uh, your point. Uh, yeah, what, how, you, you said you met General Chenault or saw him while you were serving in his unit? Yeah. What was he like as a person, as a commander? How did the men respect him? Was he an effective commander? Well, <clears throat> the captain on the New Jersey, uh, I, I imagine it was him that gave the orders to the uh, exec officer who uh, told me that we, I was going to be uh, discharged from the ship as soon as they approached the New Zealand area. And... Uh, <clears throat> A shore patrol boat came out, and I was transferred onto that, and was taken to New Zealand. And uh, they had a small, uh, well, I, I, I imagine it was a small air, air base, uh, because there was very little activity that took place outside of a few fighter planes. We didn't even have any bombers there. So they said, if you're looking for bombers, we're going to have to send you to South China. And uh, I said, where the heck is that? And they said, General Chenault. I, I didn't even know him. But uh, I found out when I was, <coughs> when I finally got there. But we were a hodgepodge of uh, people there. We had Marines, sailors, military, uh, Army, Air Force men, a uh, whole mixture of groups that were strictly lost from one group to another, and gradually, uh, towards the uh, end of the war, they finally got rid of everybody back to where they uh, should be. And uh, I kind of had to make my way back from one destroyer to another, eventually getting back to uh, Pearl Harbor, where I got back to the States. Um, let's bring us more up to the present day. Uh, how have you been involved in the Battleship New Jersey over the last several years in present day? Uh, 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 you're talking about something in particular? Oh, anything. Uh, have you been involved in, in, in re renovating the ship when it was brought back to New Jersey? You're a docent now, for example. Talk to us a little bit about your work aboard the ship over the last few years. Well, I, I can't say that anything... Uh, uh, well, prior to my, no, it was after I had left the ship, uh, the ship was in shore bombardment, and uh, they claim it was a misfired uh, five-inch shell that penetrated the mess deck area through the main deck. Uh, there was no casualties, but there was damage, and uh, apparently they took care of that okay. But the thing that got me was when, uh, in another period, the uh, Korean bor uh, shore bombardment hit directly behind the main uh, area. Uh, almost the back end of the turret number one. In fact, there's two scars across the back of that uh, turret that shows where the shell had hit. But why in the heck was three men in that area at the time that shell hit? Either they had no idea that the uh, shore bombardment 
was going to hit the ship or was within range. All three of them got hurt. One of them did not survive. The other two did. So actually, we only had one casualty aboard this ship. Okay, at this point, Sam, is there anything else that you, before we stop this part of the interview, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about the ship or your experiences aboard her that you think is important? Uh, you know? Well, there's one unusual situation that took place on this ship recently, last year to be exact. One man was in the museum area of this ship, and he tells me he was studying the model of the battleship number one by BB-16, and he swore there was a man in white uniform standing alongside him. He turned around to talk to him, and the figure disappeared. Now, he was told, do not talk about a supposed ghost on this ship. Well, oddly enough, a very similar situation happened to me. I was standing alone on the starboard side rail. There was no one else around. And alongside of me, I swear, there was a man in white uniform. And I assumed it to be somebody dressed that way, standing there. And when I talk, turned around to talk to him, it was gone. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, is this the spirit of the man who was killed as a result of the shore bombardment and that hit turret number one? Or was it somebody who lived in the museum area when that was a uh, birthing area? But we were told not to say anything about it. We don't want to scare people. But I'll tell you one thing. Whenever we had kids on board, I found it very interesting to them to talk about a ghost. They want to see them. They want to see the ghost. The ghost. But I tell them, as long as there are a crowd around, he's not going to appear. If you're by yourself, you just might see him. Interesting. Well, thank you very much. On that word, we'll, we'll complete this part of the interview because the next step will be for us to go back down to the communication center and, and tape you doing the, the five or seven minute presentation. Sam, thank you very much. I've been talking with Mr. Sam Konsevich, am I saying that correctly? Uh, who's a docent aboard the battleship in New Jersey. He's a plank owner. Um, who served aboard the ship while he was in the American Army Air Force. Um, today is March 14th, <coughs> year 2003. My name is Dr. Tom Bennett. We'll continue this interview in a few minutes downstairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is the ship's main communication station. All messages that either left this ship or came into this ship came into this compartment here. Prior to World War II, the average communication systems, the coded speed would be approximately 13 words a minute, which would sound a little bit like this. Now, if you were a radio operator, you would be able to read that message as welcome to the battleship, New Jersey. We hope you enjoy your visit. But during that time of World War II, 13 words a minute was not acceptable because it's easy to copy and easy to interpret. They decided, let's try a much higher speed where a human ear cannot copy and the human hand cannot send it. It had to be handled completely by computer and that was handled in such a way 
that would sound a little bit like this. Now that sounded like a lot of noise, but there was a message involved in that. Any message that came in was put on computer through computer tape similar to this here and eventually ended up in this machine which would then read it out into this ancient 50-year-old teletype. It's under reconditioning right now. I've otherwise eventually I'd be able to give you that message on that teletype and that would read the same as that particular coded message welcome to the battleship new jersey we hope you enjoy your visit so much for interior communications they were not satisfied with computer operation or standard 13 words a minute they decided it's too easy to interpret, too easy to copy. But during that time, somebody advised, let's try something completely different. No code, but a foreign language. Somebody figured out, let's try an Indian language. They decided the Navajo Indian tribe had a complete undistinguishable language and they felt that with a little modification, Navy technology can be converted into Navajo Indian language. Some adjustments had to be made and it was done. And I can tell you this, this much, that today no one was ever able they copy the Navajo Indian language and interpret their particular messages. A few years ago, President Bush, in order to acknowledge the work that the Navajo Indian tribe did, he issued a medal, an inch and a half in diameter, three dollars in cost, available at the local mint. Aside from that, I would be glad to show you the time I did that, I never got it back. With that, let's try some internal transmissions. When a message came into this ship that had to be transferred to either one, two, or even a dozen other offices, those particular offices are punched in on this particular machine you press the lever and you talk to all of them at the same time. But this is power operated. You're in combat. You take a hit. There's no power to operate this equipment. You must have a backup system. And that's when the power operation system. No power whatsoever is used here. It's completely sound power. You select that particular office that you want to contact, put your dial to the right tone, and make your communication that way, pick up the, ref the telephone, and you're ready for conversation. If a message is to be transferred to some other part of the ship, not listed here, not listed here. Sound power system, earphones, and speaker. <coughs> of course, you're in a combat area, you must wear a helmet. With that, so much for this particular area, let's go to your next station. Okay, this originally was a cruise a berthing area, but in order to have this type of display, something had to be removed and so the cruise berthing was eliminated. And you may have seen on the outside of this ship, on the upper levels, there's 19 combat awards 
that are indicated right there, which indicates each one of those particular ribbons earned by this ship. And these gold stars, they represent where one of those ribbons was earned in combat. If this button was working and I pressed that button, you would get a recorded description that would tell you on each one of these locations who was involved, what was the issue, what ship took place, what was the results and what happened. But if it was working, I wouldn't press that button anyway. Because each one of these gold stars, they represent a combat description that would take at least 15 to 20 minutes to get the complete story. They would tell you who was involved and what was the issue. So with that, I tell everybody, let's forget about this story. Now let's take a look at that window right there. This represents a few of the tools used in the construction of the battleship Wisconsin and the battleship with New Jersey. They were built side by side at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And there's a little story connected with this. I've told it sometimes before. The superintendent of ships who was in charge of installing gun turrets on both ships. That particular picture there tells you what happened, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. The superintendent of ships calculated the weight of one turret, turret number one on this ship, at 750,000 pounds. The crane he selected to lift that weight was rated at 780,000 pounds. That meant there was a margin of error of 30,000 pounds. He was asked, what are you gonna do now? The nearest crane available is three days away. That's a loss of time. He decided, I wanna stand underneath that turret from the time it's lifted up to the time it's installed on the ship. He was asked again, why the heck would you risk your life under that turret for that 30,000 pounds? He said, if that crane should fail and that turret came down, I will not be available to answer any questions as to what the heck happened and why. Now that was 60 years ago. The Navy's not much different today. The least little thing that happens on any ship that should not happen, somebody's going to answer to a lot of questions and somebody's going to take the blame. With that, take a look around at the rest of this exhibit. And incidentally, the flag in this case is one of the original flags flown by this ship in World War II. The three different models here showed a difference in configuration of one ship to another. And this model over here is the model was number BB-16. It was built in 1907. It was only in commission for three years and the Navy decommissioned it. But during that time, The Army Air Force was doing a little practicing and they issued a challenge to the Navy and they said, we can sink any one of your ships. The Navy, being skeptical as they were, said, there's your target. And on the very first bomber pass, dropped a bomb down the center stack and blew the ship right in half. It's now at the bottom of the ocean off of Cape Hatteras, New Jersey. With that, there's another story right out here, and I'll tell you about that, <clears throat> about a watertight door. It's a standard watertight door. It could be found on anywhere on this ship. During the Korean War, or after the Korean War, when this ship got word they were going to be decommissioned, 
A lot of the crew were very unhappy because it meant they were going to be sent to different areas and they were probably would not like to be there. One man in particular, we don't know who it was, and I doubt if we'll ever find out, <coughs> decided to write on the inside of this door on how he felt about leaving this ship. And this is an interpretation of what he wrote here. But the odd thing about all of this, before the ship was closed up, two men, it might have even been three, we don't know that either, they decided to take this door off the hinges and hide it someplace on this ship. We found it about three years ago in our general inspection. We felt there was enough story behind it to put it on display. Now you might wonder why did it take three men to hide that door? There's over 300 compartments on this ship. You could hide almost anything anywhere. But this door me measures 26 inches wide, 66 inches long, and it weighs at least 138 pounds. One man is not going to take that door and hide it anywhere on this ship. And with that, you can go to your next station for your next display.